Just recently, you can buy an official Commodore 64 that has a PC inside, the C64X. It's official, and it's fantastic, with a full mechanical keyboard, proper cursor keys, USB ports, HDMI, and everything you'd expect from a mini PC, plus the classic look and feel of the Commodore 64. Everything you'd expect? Well, not quite everything I would expect. Because although it has analog video outputs, I don't think you can connect them to a 15 kilohertz CRT monitor, or in other words, a CRT that works at low resolution, like the ones commonly used for 8-bit machines. And why would you want to connect this thing to a CRT? The answer is simple. Because yes, this isn't exactly a Moons of Darcelon making of video. It's about how I created a fake Commodore 64 that looks as authentic as possible to run Moons of Darcelon. So, is it even possible? I mean, can you connect a modern PC to a CRT? Yes, there are options, but most of them are terrible. There are HDMI to VGA adapters, HDMI to S-Video adapters, but they all have issues for one reason or another. Some introduce lag. I've tested a few that do lag and even drop frames for no apparent reason. Others downscale the signal, so you never know how the pixels will look, or they output an interlaced signal. While interlaced is a way to achieve high resolution on 15 kHz CRTs, it flickers and isn't really what an 8-bit enthusiast wants. We want that 240p resolution that fits the classic 8-bit machines like the Spectrum, Commodore, NES, and even arcades. For true pixel-perfect resolution, not the so-called pixel-perfect of today, but real 8-bit pixel perfection, we need a 15 kHz analog video output with a vertical resolution close to 240p. So, is it possible to get this kind of signal with a modern machine? I think there are specific converters designed to create that perfect 8-bit pixel look. I've seen some on YouTube channels like Retro RGB. Some were pricey, others more affordable, but there were reasons I didn't go for one, whether it was firmware updates, the cost, or maybe just me remembering wrong. Honestly, I can't say for sure if they even exist or if I'm mixing things up. In any case, if they do exist, these converters work on the premise that the machine outputs a high-resolution signal that's then downscaled, which makes me question if the pixels won't end up with some distortion. My idea was to fit a mini PC inside a Commodore 64 case, outputting 240p so I could connect it to a CRT and run Moons of Darcelon. Initially, I thought about including one of these downscalers inside the case, but I ultimately decided on another approach, producing a 240p resolution natively on the PC and outputting it directly through an analog connection. This option is theoretically better because the PC isn't generating a high-resolution image that's output via HDMI and then subjected to a conversion process. Even if these converters don't add lag, just emitting an HDMI signal introduces some lag due to digital processing and frame buffering by the graphics card. So, can this be done? Yes, but it's complicated. Graphics cards stopped supporting these resolutions. They're not available in the OS or the driver options. On top of that, most PCs or graphics cards don't come with analog outputs like VGA anymore. We'd need an older card with a VGA output, but we'd also need drivers that allow 240p, which is no small feat. Some Intel mini PCs come with VGA, and there are hacks for Intel's graphics drivers that theoretically enable custom resolutions, like custom resolution utility. But I've tried it, and I couldn't get it to work with 240p. The other option, which I did get to work, involves older NVIDIA cards. NVIDIA drivers allow custom resolutions, and if your card has an analog output and is old enough, you can create a resolution close to 240p that an old 15 kHz CRT can accept. In my case, I got it working with two cards, the NVIDIA Quadro 600 and the NVIDIA NVS 300. Both have DVI outputs, which are directly compatible with VGA. You just need an adapter that routes the pins without any kind of conversion. You download the correct drivers from NVIDIA's website, and all that's left is to create a resolution with the right values, so Windows runs at this resolution, and so Moons of Darcelon will as well. Easy, right? Not really, because the driver doesn't work perfectly. Sometimes it gets mixed up with the custom resolutions you've created, causing them to disappear, duplicate, and become unremovable along with other hilarious bugs that made me reinstall the driver several times to start from scratch. Plus, finding the correct values for resolutions like this is an inexact science. There are some online resources to find these values, but in my experience, they don't always work. And even if they do on some TVs, they don't on others. It's odd. 
I think some TVs are more tolerant with sync signals, but it could also be that the card isn't outputting the exact values you configure, since these resolutions are so low that the hardware itself wasn't tested for these values. Even though these cards are old, remember that when they were released, everyone was working with higher resolutions. They may have been analog, yes, but we're talking about 30 kilohertz with a minimum of 480p. Anyway, if you have the patience to systematically test values, you'll eventually find ones that work for your CRT. All right, but how do you fit that card into a Commodore 64 case? You need a mini PC. In my case, I found the HP Elite desks to be quite suitable because they're very low profile. You have to remove them from their casing and do a bit of DIY work to make them fit and sit properly, but it's doable. Plus, they're affordable on eBay and come with an M.2 port. Sure, they don't have a PCI port where you can plug in a graphics card like the Quadro or my NVS 300, but you can do it using a PCIe to M.2 adapter, since M.2 is based on PCIe technology. And to place it horizontally so it fits inside the Commodore case, you need an extension cable. Many of the card's connectors will remain unconnected because M.2 only provides four PCIe lanes, while most cards typically have 16 lanes. The fascinating part is that these extra PCIe lanes are optional. The card functions with only four. This does impact the card's performance somewhat, but it mainly affects the data transmission between the CPU and the card, not the internal processing of that data. So in my understanding, it's not critical, especially for a game like Moons of Darcelon. Still, we have to ask if this older card has enough power to render Moons of Darcelon. I know you might think it shouldn't require much power since it's a 2D pixelated game, but Moons of Darcelon has a 2D dynamic lighting system, a multi-camera setup, and custom shaders that require more texture reads than usual to generate their shading. It needs around 350 gigaflops to run at 60 FPS. Nowadays, integrated graphics chips from Intel and AMD handle this with ease, but these older cards, despite taking up more physical space due to older technology, don't quite reach that power level. However, we're now talking about rendering the game at 320 by 240 pixels, so the calculations needed to render a full frame are significantly reduced. This is something these cards can handle. In the case of Moons of Darcelon, it's actually not as big an advantage as it might seem, because the game already renders its pixel art internally at low resolutions, only using the monitor's full resolution in the final layer for parallax effects. So, I wasn't entirely sure if these cards could handle rendering it until I tested it. And indeed, they can do it without much strain. Also, keep in mind that the CRT filter effects included in the game automatically deactivate at these resolutions, so that processing is saved as well. Now, to get the graphics card to work, it needs to be powered externally with 12 volts, since the PCIe doesn't supply enough power. This power adapter is connected to the main 220 volts AC supply, which also powers the mini PC's PSU. Here, there's an air duct to help expel hot air from the mini PC to the outside, as well as another one for the graphics card, made with flexible plastic sheets. The front USB ports of the mini PC are routed to the side where the original C64 had its joystick connectors and power switch. I use the rear USB ports for things like a Wi-Fi adapter and the keyboard connector. This isn't a direct connection, as I'm using the original Commodore 64 keyboard, which isn't USB. Instead, it had an internal connection to the Commodore's motherboard with multiple pins. I got it working with a Raspberry Pi Pico and custom firmware designed to interface with old keyboards. You just modify a configuration file where you map the pins to the keys, and the Pico translates the pin signals into USB key presses. It's not a perfect solution, since the keys don't exactly match those on a modern keyboard, and it doesn't always want to work right. For some reason, the Pico's error lights come on most times I power up, but it works if you unplug and replug the USB cable while it's on. So, I ended up adding a switch to the cable so I wouldn't have to keep opening the computer to disconnect and reconnect it. I usually take the fake Commodore 64 to retro events in Spain, and it's fun to see people's reactions when they see a Commodore running a game like Moons of Darcelon. Many of them believe it, though with a look of astonishment. The truth is, so many peripherals have been released for the Commodore that expand its capabilities, so when they see the game, it's not entirely implausible. I hope you like this video, and my custom fake Commodore. If you're in Spain and catch me at a retro event, come say hi! 
On another note, I'm feeling super lazy about continuing with the Making of Moons of Darcelon series, since each episode takes a ton of work to put together. And for some reason, YouTube's algorithm treated my latest videos pretty badly. I don't know why. Everything was going great, but the latest ones stopped getting the usual visibility. So I'm gathering the energy to keep going. If you want to help, share the videos with your friends. And if not, feel free to criticize me for using artificial intelligence while you use your latest gen smartphone to make life easier. Or watch gaming streamers who use a 3D avatar instead of filming themselves. Either way, it'll feed the algorithm, so it's all good.